In 1872, Irish author Sheridan Le Fanu published his novella, Carmilla. Carmilla told the story of a young woman preyed upon by a female vampire. It was incredibly ahead of its time. Not only did it predate Bram Stoker's Dracula by 26 years, making it one of the first notable vampire texts, but its titular character is also the prototypical lesbian vampire. 100 years later in cinema, the lesbian vampire became almost as prolific an archetype as Count Dracula himself. By the early 1970s, Hammer Films had already produced several Dracula films, so then turned their attention to Carmilla. With censorship laws relaxing in both the UK and the US, and a boom in exploitation films around the world, Hammer took the opportunity to bring Carmilla to the big screen with The Vampire Lovers, a film that included explicit nudity and lesbian sex, as well as the blood and violence we'd come to expect from Hammer. The Vampire Lovers ended up becoming the first chapter in a loose trilogy of Hammer horror films known as the Karnstein Trilogy. They all took plot elements from the original Carmilla text, but they also, most importantly, all included daring lesbian storylines alongside vampire horror. With this steamy new trilogy of films, it was clear that both Hammer Horror and the vampire subgenre were entering a bold new era. Join me as we continue exploring the evolution of the vampire and we discuss the vampire lovers and twins of evil. Welcome back to the Evolution of Horror. My name is Mike Munzer, and as ever, I am your host. If you're tuning in for the first time, then welcome. In this podcast, we explore and dissect the history and the evolution of the horror genre by looking at particular subgenres one series at a time. We are currently in the middle of our eighth series exploring the evolution of the vampire movie, and this is part nine. This week's episode is sponsored by $20 Patreon subscriber Tony Ware, and in this week's episode, as that intro suggested, we are going to be double billing some Hammer lesbian vampire films. That's The Vampire Lovers from 1970 and Twins of Evil from 1971. Both of these will be spoilerific discussions. Uh, Go and give both movies a watch before listening, because honestly, they are so much fun. So, joining me to discuss boobs, bisexuals, and floaty lesbian vampires, she is a longtime friend of the pod. She's a film producer and filmmaker. Uh, she was last here on the podcast discussing killer clowns from outer space with me, and she's back. Welcome to the podcast, Jen Handorf. Hi, Jen. Hiya. Hello. <laughs> How are you? I'm doing good. It's been really sunny lately, so I feel like like a really bouncy joyous goth although mm-hmm. um uh i'm i'm one of these goths who's like pale all year round except i get freckles <laughs> and now it's really confusing me because it's just like <laughs> it's like oh oh is that what i look like with freckles cool okay that's fine no <laughs> um I love it. a beautiful morning to watch some lesbian vampire movies though right very that's true nice. i like a, be- a beautiful morning to watch and discuss lesbian vampire films and mm. uh i will get into this more but not not as much lesbians as i would as I would have liked. There's a little bit of maybe bisexual uh, vampire eraser erasure occurring here. Um, right. I think you know. There, let's we could dive into that a little bit more we later. We will. We but absolutely will. Yeah. I would debate there are there are no lesbian vampires in these films, but just That's... gender fluid vampires. Oh, I'm I'm excited <laughs> to discuss this. But you're absolutely right. Yeah. Uh, let me start off by asking you a bit about vampires in general. Are you are you a fan, Jen, of like vampires, vampire movies? Vampires are hella cool. Of course. There's, I mean, they're the coolest monster, right? Well, like quite literally. I mean, one of their superpowers is charisma. So yeah, like legit they're cool and they're sexy like it is in their <laughs> dna it's like hey what if sex was a monster what if cool mm-hmm. sex was a monster not embarrassing first time sex but like cool sex was mm-hmm. a monster yeah. then you know that's what you get 
true. It's so true. Like I've discussed this with people already, but yeah, it's definitely the sexiest monster in horror, right? And what is it? What even is a demon that's sexy if not a vampire? Like I think yeah. Buffy. Buffy basically was like, yeah, but guys, sexy demons are vampires. Like, exactly. So exactly. No, it is. I think it is. It's a monster of sex. Like if if the slash if, uh, if the slasher is the sort of penetrative punitive mm. monster of sex then then vampires are the siren the the sort of the dangerous allure of sexuality rather than the vicious consequence and they're probably arguably one of the most prolific monsters in horror history right going all the way back to you know whether you argue dracula is one of the first ever horror films or even if you argue nosferatu is right <laughs> whatever it's it's always the vampire right and and they've kind of really endured haven't they all the way up until now it's interesting because it's it's if you look at those sort of uh, uh, universal monsters as the mm. sort of core tenets of of horror film monsters, not that mole men or, or swamp things are, are really that prolific, but yeah. um, you know if you look at something like demons, they're all different. They've got names in the Bible. We don't really put them all together because they're all so different. If you look at um, werewolves. Uh, it's not like there is a Dracula or a Nosferatu for werewolves. They're all mm. werewolves. And then you look at Frankenstein's monster and it's the opposite. There is only the one Frankenstein's monster. <laughs> so, yes. Um, yes. Uh, but so, you know, in that sense, I think the mythology of vampires is totally different. And it's also older than film. The mythology of vampires goes back before film really started. And again, it mm. sort of has roots in that biblical aspect but, um, you know, I, it'd be interesting to see where it's separated out. But then you get brilliant things. And I don't know if you're touching on this in, in other conversations, but you get brilliant things like like hopping vampires in Asia where the rules are totally yes. different. And mm-hmm. and even in the ones uh, we're talking about today, like sunlight, it's a bit iffy on sunlight. Um, it's a bit iffy on what happens if you burn them. But definitely decapitation <laughs> yes. and stakes to the heart are consistent with common vampire mythology in these films but yeah Mm -hmm. it's it's you know they're they're sort of the boogeyman right like the only thing that maybe defines a vampire is it's got fangs and drinks blood yeah so yeah you know isn't that just a monster like it's It's so it's it's sort of like yeah yeah it's like it's like the the basic vanilla sponge on which you can pile an interesting looking cake or something you know (laughs) exactly and it's and it's quite classically camp um the, the films we're going to talk about are kind of the origin of the campification of vampires and there's a thing there's a thing dan and i talk about that we refer to as the chardonnay effect and it's when something <laughs> like in the 80s maybe 80s or 90s like chardonnay was actually this cheap really nice wine with this slightly oaky taste to it and then as it got popular people started putting like oak flavoring in wine and just really like putting, you know, <laughs> drops of smokiness and grape juice. And, and you ended up getting this vast quantity of Chardonnays that, that they taste like Chardonnay, but like a, like a caricature of it. Mm. Um, so, so the Chardonnay effect is where you get this thing where it's, it doesn't really resemble the original at all. It's got none of the, the original <laughs> good qualities of the original. Um, but that it, you you know, you could still see how they're described as the same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I feel like to some extent that has happened with vampires, based on really quite specifically these these the, well this trilogy of film of which we're going to talk about too. Yeah, I completely agree. And actually, speaking of, let me ask you about you know as well as being one of the sexiest monsters, I think you could also argue it's one of the queerest monsters, right? I I, I feel like all, going all the way back to texts like Carmilla and even Dracula. Uh, vampires have been associated with kind of uh, queer storytelling and queer characters as well, whether it's coded or more overt. Um, what do you think of that and that sort of connection between sort of vampire and, and queer horror? So I'm glad it's there because I think the reason people identify with that or identify that as being queer coded is because there was nothing presenting queer yeah. at the time. <laughs> so, yeah. which is Which is, you know, again... I'm sure I'll just keep saying this. I am disappointed with the low level of lesbians in these films. Um, (laughs) I, I, you know, they are bisexuals. They are people who have sex with both genders. Uh, Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I think just at the time, the idea of bisexuality was so, uh, so 
out there, like so yeah. uh, fetishistic or you know strange, that lesbians were as far as they could go with it. Um, and and I would go the same direction just with vampires in general. They're sexual. They're omnisexual. They mm, are fuckboys. Mm-hmm. They are bimbos. They have sex with literally everyone. Um, and even if you look at you know the the Keanu Reeves which, you know, is quite seminal for a lot of people. There's rampant bisexuality in that as well. Nobody is only having sex with one gender. Everybody's getting laid. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so, you know, it's the, the so the notion that these films are interpreted as uh, queer coded rather than sex positive, um, mm. it definitely makes sense to me because we weren't seeing queer relationships a lot of other places. But really, it just goes to show how sort of resistant people or or even were were or even are i should say to that open sexuality or the idea of fluid sexuality because they had to put it in the box of queer it has yeah. to be like it's like no 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 these are lesbians but they 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 literally have sex with men yeah yeah no but full blown full blown lesbians we're going to yeah. we're going to call it call it lesbians but they have sex with men. No, they're lesbians. <laughs> yeah. Lesbians have sex with men. Also, also, um, you know, and I'm not saying I mind this because as a as a card carrying bisexual, it's some hot ladies in these in this film in these films. <laughs> it's fun to watch, but but it's also that very sort of like summer camp idea of lesbianism where it's like mm. women chasing each other with pillows and like giggling yeah. until they collapse breathless into the bed and and stare at each other's breasts like there's no scissoring in this movie that's not no. that's not how it works yeah you're so right about that and we'll talk about this as we get into the films but it's like yeah is are these movies kind of progressive and a step in the right direction or actually are they a sort of male gazy fantasy you know kind of like exploitation movies essentially i mean right? you know? a thing can be two things you yeah know? it's yeah. it's uh i think as i say you know that to if if a bisexual woman wanted to go into the cinema in 1968 well, let's let's even move it. Actually, it's great because the year would be 1969. Actually, would be the last year that you couldn't go see a film like this in the cinema. So, yes, for all, for yeah. all. Um, But then, <laughs> as the as the very brilliant documentary on the Blu-ray for lesbian vampires, uh, sorry mm. for uh, vampire lovers, says um, the X rating got bumped up to 18, uh, which meant that they felt like they could actually be a bit harder with X films. Uh, mm-hmm. So you know, so the X rating came out for 18s in 1970, which was when Vampire Lovers came out, mm. was made and came out. Um, and so, you know, if if a card-carrying bisexual woman wanted to go see some boobies in the cinema in 1969, she'd kind of struggle to do that. There wouldn't be a lot of it about. But, you know, Vampire Lovers, 1970, party time. Lots of there boobies. There it is. There uh, just, it is. Just boobies yeah. for days. And it's... And I, I There's a bit... And I don't know if this, like pinged for you in the same way it did for me (laughs) but there's a bit in this first one in vampire lovers where uh ostensibly what we're told is is a girl so not an adult woman but a girl which all these characters are girls even though they're in their 30s um uh uh ingrid pitt the star was advertised as being 25 but was in fact 32 when this (laughs) when this film was made but all the press release made her seven years younger um but uh but yeah this you know there's this dying girl and someone's like, oh no, she's died. And the doctor comes bursting into the room and he undoes her blouse to take her heartbeat ostensibly. And it's just like, just enough to expose a nipple. And it's <laughs> yeah. like, Here's did you notice that? Did you yeah. feel a bit like, are we just looking at a dead kid's boob? Is that <laughs> yeah. is that what the filmmakers are instructing us to engage with in this scene? It's not even, Absolutely. so it's not like the first boobs are not even really presented as titillating. Ha <laughs> ha. Um, but uh, but it is just like look at some boob. Here's some yeah. boob in this yeah. film. It's so yeah, you're so right. And actually, maybe this is a good good p- place to start talking about that kind of uh, a kind of shift in cinema, I suppose, at this point, right? And I think culture was shifting, censorship was sif- shifting. And there was this kind of perfect storm of something happening here in the late '60s and early '70s, right? Which kind of resulted in this wave of saucy lesbian vampire movies, basically, because uh, so you know all throughout the kind of I think from the 1930s through to the late 1960s in America we had the Hayes Code right the production code which was incredibly 
strict and basically forbid any movie from depicting anything remotely sexual or controversial that didn't adhere to kind of, you know, very kind of Christian stuffy norms, I suppose, um, and values. And, and so everything had to be kind of implied in American cinema throughout that era, you know. And actually, me and Axel Carolyn already talked about Dracula's Daughter, which was a kind of weirdly early example of the lesbian vampire. Um, but everything was very implied. Nothing was shown. You know, this was Dracula's Daughter was 1936. And they couldn't get away with actually showing lesbianism overtly on screen. It was just kind of hinted at, you know. Um, but And also there is this kind of negative connotation of it too. You know, Dracula's daughter was a kind of example of a, um, a remorseful vampire as well, a reluctant vampire. The whole story of that was that Dracula's daughter wanted to cure herself of vampirism so that, so that she could, quote, go back to normal and think normal thoughts. And that, I think, is linked in with this idea of she's thinking you know, saucy lesbian thoughts, and she doesn't want that, you know, it's an affliction. So queerness was kind of subtly woven into some of these movies, but it was often very subtle, or it could be to negative effect, right, or have negative connotations. Um, And then everything changed in the late 60s, because around 1968, the production code, the Hayes Code over in the US was abolished and was replaced by what we now know as the sort of the general MPAA rating system, which meant that less movies were actually outright censored and cut, but instead they were made more age appropriate. And then similarly, something very similar happened over in the UK. So up until the sort of late 60s, we had had the X certificate, which basically meant that no one over the age of 16 should watch anything. And that meant that a lot was cut because, you know, even movies with sex and violence that might be appropriate for adults weren't necessarily appropriate for 16 year olds. So there was still heavy censorship going on. But in 1970, this did change where we had uh, the X certificate uh, change to an 18 uh, minimum age rather than 16. I think the 16 minimum age was given a, an AA certificate. So, uh, so that was kind of a big change because it meant that now X certificate movies that were available for 18 year olds but not 16 year olds could be a little bit racier and a little bit saucier and so what we got was in Hollywood censorship was relaxing in the UK censorship was relaxing in Europe, it had always been fairly relaxed, right? But what, what now happened was that UK and US distributors and filmmakers could be as racy as their European cousins, which meant that there was a boom in exploitation movies in the 1970s. And of course, that's what we get, right? We, we all associate the early 1970s with you know, uh, whether it's, you know, Last Tango in Paris or A Clockwork Orange or, you know, all of these movies that that contained a lot more explicit content, the likes of which we had never seen before. So obviously Hammer, you know, I guess at this point, right, Jen, kind of jumped on the bandwagon and they thought we'll have some of this. Um, You know, they've always been ones to kind of jump on trends, uh, you know, jump on what's popular. And it really felt like in 1970, they really went for it. With, with bringing audiences sl- something slightly more risque and slightly more exploitation. Well, I want to talk about Hammer generally a little bit um, because I think that to understand why these films are kind of so benchmarky, you really have to understand a little bit about um, how, ham- that, how Hammer came to be. Yeah. Um, and so I didn't know some of this before and some of it came from the documentary and some of it came from a bit of a deeper dive. Mm. But um, the, the thing that initially interested me about Hammer is that it was two brothers who one of them very quickly went off to fo- uh, found a jewelry company. And this is oh. in the early thirties, uh, mm-hmm. Jay Hines, which I think is still around. Um, oh yeah. yeah. So that was, that was one of the brothers. And the other one went off to do vaudeville and mm. created the stage name hammer for himself mm-hmm. and uh, did these theatrical shows, ran some theaters, ran some venues and then started hammer films. Mm-hmm. And so when you think about the idea that it it was really based in these productions as a taste level, as an idea of entertaining an audience, were based in that kind of vaudeville, you know, burlesque 
uh, shiny things. I love that his brother is a jeweler because I want to talk about that a little bit with this film as well. Yeah. Um, I genuinely, I was trying to find out if they ever gave jewels to the Hammer films because actually when you go back and look at them, there's quite some impressive jewellery throughout the yeah. films. Costumes and production design are always quite lush, aren't they? It's, yeah. it's stunning. And again, I think this is that theatrical vaudevillian background. You know, these are mm. built, painted sets. It was all based on this very theatrical sort of presentations. Um, so, uh, he eventually brought on a financial guy, uh, uh, to help him with it. Um, and then, you know, they, they got into distribution a little bit, but it turns out they didn't quite get distribution. They got audiences and so they stopped production and then they were just distribution for a bit. And then, uh, they decided to take another stab at it. And it was at this point that the original founder's son came on board Mm. Who most people know as the sort of uh, as the sort of godfather of Hammer. Yes, Anthony Hines, right? Anthony, yeah, and, and we've talked about them already up until this point. Anthony Hines and James Carreras, who were kind of really, like you say, the sort of godfathers of Hammer horror, right? They they produced the early Hammer horror movies like The Quatermass Experiment, of course, Dracula, and a load of those movies through the nineteen sixties that you know became this huge success and and made Hammer this this brand this thing that we all know of right and yeah like you say anthony hines was a huge part of that he fed, got fed up in 1969 mm. uh with the way the industry was going he was very much like his father very much engaged with the taste and the pageantry and the theatricalness and giving the audience what they want in that sense um but there was this influence of american investment uh, in, yeah. in British film at this time. And that investment was becoming less and less. And there were partnerships pursued with American companies, which were much more B-list, sort of C-list, definitely mm. sex films, sexploitation mm-hmm. films. Um, and he felt frustrated by that process and left the company. So this film, uh, Vampire Lovers, this trilogy of films was the only film to come out of that collaboration with this particular uh, American financier. Um, and it it really feels like you can see people trying to make films with the hammer voice, but without that actual individual there, the person who was driving those those taste choices was absent. Yeah, that's right. Because the Vampire Lovers, right? It was, um, I think it was in partnership with American International Pictures. And yeah, you're right. We've got new producers from this point, Michael Style and Harry Fine. And yeah, there is a kind of, there's a difference, isn't there, I think? This is really the moment that these films start to have the Chardonnay effect, where it's where they're trying to make a thing like that. And in doing so, you end up with pastiche, you end up with references. Like it's it's a lot um reminds me of like Mario Bava, Black Sunday, um, you know, things like Witchfinder General and Blood on Satan's Claw. Like it's very much in that arena. Um, but you know, it are they really that unique or interesting on their own? No, because they're just these sort of iconographic uh montages of all these other styles like there's no narrative the narrative is like oh there's a vampire like it's the same narrative yeah. it's like there's a vampire yeah. it kills some people it sleeps with some people it nearly kills someone else and then they kill it yes and that's that's plot done like yes. plot done. Think, <laughs> absolutely and i think you know and even though the vampire lovers and we'll talk about it i mean it is based on carmilla the the novella but really mm. it's it feels like they're slightly less interested in that as they are in like you say it's the exploitation stuff isn't it this movie is the one with the lesbian bubbies. sex it's the one with bubbies. all the boobs you know show them your bubbies yeah um, exactly to the extent that like the the twins in this in um in the second film uh, mm. uh twins of evil they're they're playboy models yeah. And that film is so damn lucky that they are both as great on film and as capable as actresses as they were. Because if they were any less talented, that film would not have held together in in, in the slightest. The the lovely velvet bust lines and frilly feathered hats can only get you so far through a film. It, you know, some somebody with talent has to be wearing them. And and 
holy smokes. You know, you look at films like Piranha 3D where um, uh, uh, you get like page six girls in to to get their baps out and this kind of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, God bless them. But the performance is not there. Like, it's no. not the same kind of thing. You know, I feel like I feel like maybe these films set an unfair advantage for sorry, an unfair standard for expectations of what uh, nude, nude models would bring to the table as actresses and leads in films. Um, it's true. But yeah, even Ingrid Pitt in um, Vampire Lovers, like she she was a sex symbol. Like she was brought in to bring the sex to yeah. the movie. Yeah, um, totally, totally. Yeah, you can see what they're going for with these movies, right? And and they do, you know, they they always sort of say that they come from something slightly a more slightly more uh, literary place because they're sort of loose adaptations of <laughs> Carmilla and stuff but i'm not sure how much they're worried about I, that kind of stuff <laughs> i love this i was reading about how when they got their ratings um they showed the first script to the uh, uk censor board and they were like uh, not so sure about all this lesbian stuff mm. and they were like it's in the book it's in the mm. original text the book is old and it's in the book so it's not filthy because it's in yeah. the book can't be filthy if it's in a book it's like it's from a oh book. my god there's some it's... filthy books out there i don't know what the board of censors is like well if it's on the written page it must not I be lo- censorable i uh, love it it's one of those things and we've talked about this before but it's that idea of horror is somehow slightly more respected when it's based on gothic literature or literature of some <laughs> kind right you know well, there's if someone no, in, a, there's... in a laced up bodice wrote it then it must be it must be exactly there's no great zombie novel in the way that there is a a great vampire novel right and i think that's the reason why zombies were always less respected on film than vampires were no respect (laughs) (laughs) they're not sexy Um, either like you know we can't deny how much being cute gets you in this world like exactly everybody likes looking at a vampire nobody's going oh i really you know i i I had sexual fantasies about that zombie when i was a kid in the same way that they talk about other films with vampires in it's so true it's so true um so let me just ask you as well about your history with hammer have you are you sort of generally a kind of hammer horror fan i, I myself sort of came to it quite late really but I, what's your kind of history with it yeah i definitely came to it late because you know again growing up in the states it just wasn't accessible mm-hmm. um i you know i'm definitely an anglophile so things it was it was not long for me to go from my upbringing on things like you know, just BBC, Monty Python, whatever, into those kind of films when they became accessible to me. But, you know, I definitely saw the things that referenced them well before I saw them. So things, you know, like Bram Stoker's Dracula, like um, those kind of modern, oh, you know, I <laughs> things like, you know, Young Frankenstein and that kind mm, of stuff, like the pastiche, mm-hmm. the comedy versions of them were something I yeah. was way more familiar with. Yeah. Um, than the films themselves. Uh, but yeah, really late for me. And I think because, you know, I was more familiar with the late stage uh, replicas of them, I found some of it to be hokey and pat. But the more I got into it and the more I saw like the highlights of it and understood the origins, I really, you know, you can fall into it more. So it doesn't, like, they're certainly not timeless. Um, but if you watch something like, like a modern film, like the love witch and you like it, then you're going to love all of hammer. Like there's definitely, definitely ways in, but yeah, unfortunately I think because it's been so pantomimed, it can be difficult to get into them. Sometimes they can feel cheaper. They can feel hokey. Yeah. But when you look at the artistry behind it, it's absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah. It's quite, it's quite fascinating, isn't it? Um, especially from a, from a producer standpoint, I imagine mm. it must be quite, because the, the, the absolute, mm. the speed in which they churned out these movies as well. Like they, they were, they were, they were putting out three to four major horror releases per year i think often all filmed on the same sets sharing the same bits of set you know that kind of thing using the same actors like obviously Peter and they're Cushing, so affordable Lee. like yeah. they're crazy they were they were like two i mean they were they cost the same as a tv show basically yeah um uh yeah. two 200 300k uh which you know with inflation they'd be making these things at like a million quid something like that um but uh absolutely absolutely bizarre to to be doing them so quickly but again if you go back to that theatrical model you build the set you use the set it was a you know the the 
the the partner who the brother brought on was a financial guy. So they were literally looking at it from a f- efficiency, how to get the audience what they wanted in the most efficient manner. And they did it. Like, box ticked. Yeah. And then when the paradigm shifted into films that were expensive, like uh, Rosemary's Baby, like these big blockbuster films that were massively pushed out, um, yeah, it's like you said, they they had to find a different way to compete. And the direction they went was to get the guy who wrote Barbarella and tell him to throw some blood on it. Come with us if you dare into a twilight world of unspeakable horror. You must die. Everybody must die. <laughs> Sample, if you dare, the deadly passion of the vampire lovers. <gasps> So let's get into it. Let's talk a little bit about The Vampire Lovers from 1970. Um, Jen, you've already said it's pretty loose on plot, right? But what's the story of The Vampire Lovers? Uh, Well, so um, uh, these two films are part of a trilogy. Uh, It's the first film and the last film of a trilogy, Vampire Lovers and Twins of Evil. Yes, that's right. Uh, uh, The Karnstein Trilogy, right? Again, that kind of name is taken from Carmilla. Um, Interestingly, you know, like you said, we're covering the first and last chapters because the middle one, Lust for a Vampire is not a great film it's <laughs> it's also like it's it's so loose it's only a trilogy in marketing like there's yeah. no oh, it's yeah. only a trilogy in marketing and in as much as like they got peter cushing to come back for the last one he he was definitely a, a reluctant player in the second <laughs> film versus his part in the first film um yeah. but uh but yeah i mean gosh what's to say there's this castle <laughs> who knew in a vampire film there's this castle and funnily enough it's it's run owned by a count and he's got some history some form with uh vampires and uh it's been years since anyone thought of it and suddenly people start dying with two holes in their necks <laughs> including mm. including some busty young women at a girls school and then coincidentally this this lady shows up who's you know doesn't like the sun so much and they're like you should stay with all the young girls <laughs> clearly cuz lesbians yeah. don't exist and vampires don't exist this will be fine um and uh and then suddenly the young girls start dying like what's that about and they get all these holes in their necks and it's from a brooch it's very easily explained away apparently um yeah and then you know some 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 boffin down at the lab figures out something's going on, and uh, and they're like, oh, by the way, we have to chop off their heads, or she's gonna kill all of her daughters. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, there you go. <laughs> that's, there you the, go. that's the plot. Of the film. I I love it because basically also the plot it, of the next film though it's, it's important. Good, yeah. <laughs> and, and the next one has a little bit more going on because there is a, a bit of a kind of witch hunter vibe to it as well. Mm. Um, whereas this one is literally like, it's quite weird structure, isn't it? It's kind of like this vampire goes and stays with this family. She, uh, you know, n- nibbles on her boobs for a while until that girl <laughs> dies. Then she moves on to the next girl. And it's kind of just like this Carmilla, and- Mercala, whatever her name is, different anagrams each time, kind of just like going through different women. Basically, No one's suspicious. It's- don't no. be suspicious. Don't be suspicious. Like she's, she's just like, they're, again, they're like, no, no, no. And you know what it is actually, because they all fancy her. All the men fancy her. All the fathers and the the men of the household fancy her. Yeah. So again, it's it's just by erasure because they're yeah. like, oh well, she's definitely not into the women because she's into men. So very clearly, the women yeah. are safe. We can put the women in the room. She is the only one in the room with them when they keep dying, but I'm sure that's fine. That's yeah. clearly not a problem. It's, you know, like, <laughs> know it's, it's, so it's so incredulous. But that's the thing is it's not about the plot. It's about the pretty boobs and the pretty dresses and the shiny rocks that they've they've got in their jewellery and yes, the lovely costuming. Exactly. And that's and that's what they're giving us. Like, that's the intent of the film. And it's yeah. but really, you know, all they wanted to give us was boobies and boobies they gave us. <laughs> I know, right? It's uh, it's brilliant. I I I enjoyed it for what it was, right? And oh I yeah, for some sure. Of the perform- some of the performances are good, and like the, some of the set pieces are fun. You know, it's good. It's no, no, no. It's a great film, and like you know, I love boobies. So like that was yeah. cool. It's fine. Yeah. Don't watch it with your parents. That'd be weird. But That'd you can imagine that in 1970, going on a sassy date, that was probably quite 
quite the cinematic experience. Absolutely. And I, I do think there's something quite fun about these films in that at least Ingrid, Ingrid Pitt does get to sort of do some stuff, right? Like but one of the things we, so far on this podcast, we've talked about the Hammer Dracula movies. Mm. And at this point, by about 1970, we'd had about six Hammer Dracula movies with Christopher Lee. And with each movie, Christopher Lee had less and less to do, right? Much mm. to his anger and resentment <laughs> at even playing Dracula at this point. You know, there is one film, Dracula Prince of Darkness, where he has literally no lines of dialogue. He is silent throughout. And other movies where he kind of pops in and out. Yeah, furious. Um, And I will say what's interesting about this, it's quite refreshing. Having watched so many Dracula movies over the last few weeks, it was kind of fun to watch something a little bit different, to see something where Ingrid Pitt gets to have a bit of fun with this role. and, And actually, she does take more of a kind of starring role in this as opposed to a kind of silent peripheral kind of monster on the you know on the outskirts which is quite a nice change in this trilogy i think you know absolutely it's definitely female centric and again i think that's part of where this lesbian concept comes from is it's actually just sexually empowered women i mean they're not even necessarily bisexual they're just sexually empowered um and they're driving their own desires and they're seen as villains because of that and and that i do think is a bit where culture at the time was behind itself definitely in one of the many ways um but again it was also empowering because as a as a woman to go see that on screen and see this badass sexy woman with her bubs out kissing Mm -hmm. another woman it's like oh cool oh well she's she's pretty cool (laughs) yeah that's right i think that's the other thing i mean we sort of touched upon it but that's the other thing about vampires right is that they are like you said they're so cool and part Mm. of that is that there's a certain freedom to living as a vampire right you live forever you have sex with who you want to have sex with you live how you want to live you're on the fringes of kind of you know quote unquote civilized society i suppose you don't live by society's rules and that involved about this point at this point in time maybe being a bit more sexually liberated than you could be at the time right and yeah exactly. that's all quite and interesting it is, it's um it is too i like what you say about the vampires on the edge of of society because it is you know we are the weirdos mister it is just exactly. that sort of like you know being being ostracized and it's loners you know they're they're not like the vampires aren't out there living their best social life they're always no. like in a castle on the top of a hill and nobody's seen them for however long um and they've got <laughs> it's a the painting. ultimate teenage goth fantasy basically it is you it? know i yeah. just want to be in my room and listen to the cure um call me vlad it's yeah um but uh but it's also i think to looking at that outsiderness um it's interesting. There's no repercussions to the sexuality. You mm. can't you can't get a disease and die. You can't get pregnant. Um, no. You have complete control over your lover. So you know there's a literal hypnotism um, mm-hmm. that occurs. Uh, let's not get into consent. Um, but like, <laughs> c- consent is sexier than these films imply. I will put that out there. But like, yes, yes, yes. Consent. To be fair to vampires, at, at least they have to be invited in, right? I mean, you know, yeah, there's a bit I of consent. There, I was thinking that earlier, where because there's a bit in in um, Vampire Lovers where where they insist on her coming back to to the, yeah. the house with them. And if you're not thinking about vampires, it just feels a bit awkward. But then you realize like she's tricking them into inviting her in because she's like, yeah. oh no, I couldn't possibly come home with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, well, yeah, you, you should come back with us. You should come, come back yeah. with us. Yeah, it'll be fine. It'll, be, it'll fine. be fine. And I think it does, like you said, they, they kind of have fun playing on that idea that like, well, this is just a, a a young, pretty lady. She couldn't possibly be dangerous. It's like, what other... <laughs> and it's like, how obvious is it that it's clearly this woman doing these things to people, but it's the last thing anyone thinks of this, because this she's a lady. With, with an Eastern European accent and like <laughs> some very erotic clothing. Um, and it's, it is, it's just, it is fun. It's incredulous. I'll put it out there. Um, so let me ask you a bit about that. We should start by talking about the lesbian, the lesbianism of the whole thing. Right. And actually, I think, I think it's really interesting. Like you said, is this actually a lesbian vampire or is it a bisexual vampire? Definitely bisexual. Cause there's no one who, there is no one in this film who has sex with a woman who has not also expressed interest in a, in a man. Mm, so, mm-hmm. you know, what can you say? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess the romance, though, there is more of a romance element between the women. You know, it does feel a little bit like the women get what they want from the men and move on, whereas there is this actual connection, emotional connection, potentially, between the women, right? Um, which is interesting. But I did think as well, I don't know what you th- about, thought about this, that there wasn't actually as much smutty lesbian stuff as I was expecting in this. And I guess it's still such 
early days in the kind of lesbian vampire canon right at this point but you know we get we get a little bit of kissing we get some boobs we get some gazing into each other's eyes but it's not actually maybe as racy as i almost expected it to be it's really it's not it's not especially when you look at you know french films like um genre lands films or Mm. um labette which would come a little bit after this like Mm. There's there's basically hardcore sex in those films, and yeah. they're not they're not you know massively out of out of time with this one. Um, so yeah, no, I full blown expected way more. Like it, it's and it's interesting, and I suppose it's because they really were there at the beginning of this sort of literal exploitation of sex to sell films. Um, that maybe you know it was a toe in the water sort of a thing. Um, but I, I, I think it's one of the reasons why they've survived though. I need, you know, it's, it's partly because they did have these initial germinations of these talented people, but then they're, they're, uh, I'm trying to think of a, they're not porn actresses. (laughs) That's that, that's way more of a generalization than I intend to make. Um, but these, these actresses who they have explicitly hired to get their boobs out. Yeah. They're basically um, like models more than they are actresses. Right. I guess there's they're, exactly. And so the fact that their performances are as good as they are, that they look mm. as good as they do on screen, that, um, that the characterizations with the, with the female leads are as interesting as they are and are actually kind of the most interesting aspects of the story is these lead characters. Yeah. Um, it's it's that mixture of planning and luck that I think makes them still stand up. Yeah. They aren't the same films. Like you, they can't be watched in the same way they'd be watched then. It's a completely different watch, but they yeah. stand up in a different way. They totally do, yeah. And and I do think this movie has some really fun moments, some great characters too. You know, like as we kind of move from house to house, you know, in the second half of the movie, we've got the introduction of the Mademoiselle Madame, Mademoiselle Peridou, right? Who is uh, played by Kate O'Mara. She's a really interesting character because what happens to her? She's kind of human. But then she becomes under the thrall of the vampire because she puts on a brooch, right? (laughs) And I love that because it does feel like there is this, like, there's this allure, obviously, to, you know, Marcella, Carmilla, whatever, um, throughout. And she really does... It, it's the it's the it's the vampire thrall thing, right? It's the hypnosis almost. But um, she does this to women a lot more than men, I think, throughout the film, and that in itself is interesting. And I think that leads back to this idea that for a woman at this era in this time, becoming a vampire and being a little bit more liberated was probably more appealing, right? You know, like you you feel like the men are much more against what's going on here and the women are kind of happy to go with it. And I guess that's why it sort of leans more into the the kind of lesbian um, area, I suppose, you know, because I, I do think the men kind of are sort of window dressing in this regard. And I also love, I love the on the noseness of the dreams that they have those kind of mental dreams about being attacked by cats giant pussies right Absol- well in this <laughs> bit in particular i'd be very surprised cuz um uh Lebec comes comes maybe 5 or 6 years after this and mm. that that to me was like bang on referentially like it it feels yeah. like they must have gotten that kind of nightmarish imagery from this yeah. but it's also it's so ridiculous the cat bit you no, yeah. it didn't. It's your brooch. It's what is yeah. it like if this was if this was a Mike Lee film, everyone would be going, you're mad. What's wrong yeah. with you? Like, yeah. know. As it's opposed true. to, well, that's credible. Yeah, exactly. Um, and we do get a bit more gore than, you know, again, I guess Vam- uh, Hammer has always been sort of known for its, you know, blood. You know, originally, you know, in the late 50s, they were the first, certainly the first British horror films in colour to actually show mm. red blood and that kind of thing. And again, they up it slightly in this one where we've got like, decapitations and that kind I of love, thing, right? I love these decapitations. They're weirdly yeah. effective. They like, are, I've actually, seen I've they? seen films from the 80s that have, like, exactly the same kind of thing that it worked. Like, it's... They're really quite good. Like, the fake they are, heads, they, they? they know where to face them and, and like, the, the... You know, it's just the action of it really worked. Yeah. Um, and I think, too, it would have been like, oh, 
kind of a surprising moment in both instances. Yeah, um, definitely. It's the way that they kind of like grab the head with one hand, swing the sword with the other, right? And then they're just sort of holding the head afterwards. It does. It's like cut together quite well. It still works, I think. And it's yeah. quite theatrical as well, I yeah. think. Like it's yeah. it's mindful of what's it, what it's doing. And again, you know, when you see these things done the first time, people are doing them, you know, doing research, going into it. Mm-hmm. And then eventually things just end up being a copy of a copy of a copy without that original... Um, uh, background work, um, but yeah, no, I I really enjoyed the blood and the gore in this. I I do find, you know, thank you Blu-ray. All of the Dracula bites, all the vampire bites, had that sort of. What were those little protectors we used to put on three hole punch paper to keep them from tearing? <laughs> yes, like those little exactly. like little circle. Like it looked like they just sort of been <laughs> stuck on in both places. I know. Um, so which so you know like there's a bit of a shame about that kind of stuff. But I think again you have to be in the spirit of it. Like it is theatrical, and I think when you yeah. consider it theatrically, that's fine. Yeah, I agree. Um, and actually, yeah, I mean we haven't even really mentioned, but the director Roy Ward Baker. You know what? What do you think of generally the job he does here um, in kind of bringing this story to life? I suppose and just the way this movie looks and the way it feels and the way it's shot again i think the direction is another really uh, sort of lucky part of the sustainability of these films is because they Mm. really work you know there's no there's no duff shots i can't imagine his direction didn't have anything to do with ingrid pitt's performance is that the right number of double negatives um i think his 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 direction must have had something to do with ingrid Ingrid pitt's performance is what i mean to say um and you know you can't underestimate the power of a director when you know, you can see films where the ingredients are all there, but mm. the direction just doesn't know how to push them through. And I think I think this plays together like a beautifully made quilt. So beautifully well done, made him. quilt. Well done, yeah. him. And of course, we've got like you know Hammer's leading man, Peter Cushing, as well <laughs> in both these films we're about to talk about. Actually, he sort of pops up in this one at the beginning, and then he sort of disappears for a massive chunk of it, right, and then sort of comes back at the end. But you know, Peter Cushing's always good; brings a bit of gravitas. Always, it feels like, right? It's it's it, like two two things. One, I have to get out of the way the fact that whenever I hear Peter Cushing's name, a little song in my head just goes: Peter Cushing lives in Winstable. I have seen him on his bicycle, which is from a stand-up <laughs> routine, and and it just plays in my head on loop for about ten minutes. So just be aware that's going on in my head while I'm trying Good. to do things right now. Now, um, Good to know. and yeah. and everyone else's, I hope. Um, yeah. but he he's he's definitely here to sell these films. The only mm-hmm. reason he is there is to be paid, mm. and to sell the films. Mm. Um, and the only reason he's not in the second one is his wife fell ill. And so that tells you, you know, how passionate he was about the films and how passionate they were about having him in him. Yeah. They, they didn't want to wait for him. He didn't want to leave his wife's side to, to be in the films. Fine. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody was cool with that because he yeah. wasn't burnt in, you know, he wasn't baked in to the DNA no. of these films. And again, I think that's one of the reasons they sustain because we're, we're used to Peter. Peter Cushing has better films. Certainly he has better films. Yeah. But these films aren't about him. He's just a little bit of like a moose bouche to kind of get us get us into the world, get us into the vibe of what's happening, right? That's right. It almost feels like a bit of a safety blanket for you know, because he was the star of the old Gothic Hammer mm. films. He was he was, you know, um Vic, he was Baron Frankenstein in the Iconographic, Frankenstein films. Yeah. He was Van Helsing in the Dracula films, so he was their hero. And I think Yes, they've gone through this huge change into slightly different territory at this point, but it's like, but don't worry, we've still got Peter Cushing. It's like, Absolutely. you know, he's still here. He's still with a kind of stamp of hammer approval almost, you know. You can hear you can hear the finance meeting where it's like, uh, well, you know, what I, I don't see any male roles in this. What's going on? It's like, oh, no, no, we've got Peter Cushing. He's, he's playing the witch finder and then also the dad. But I know he only pops in and out, but we've only got him for three days. So it really mm. works with his scale. You know, like it's mm-hmm. it feels like a business decision, but it works because you know there are better Peter Cushing films and I think these films would have gotten very eclipsed by those if it Mm -hmm. hadn't been for the female protagonists yeah yeah completely agree Um, so there you go anything else you want to mention on um, Vampire Lovers I mean how do you think it sort of holds up watching it now in 2022 I I had a great time with it I Mm -hmm. I think it's definitely you know one to consensually play on a date like you wouldn't you wouldn't want to spring it on somebody but if you're looking to to Netflix and chill it's not a bad one to put on it's quite yeah. sexy well there's it yeah do you actually do you think these movies are in any way scary still uh, or are they even concerned with being scary do you think <laughs> um so 
I got really freaked out in Twins of Evil because of the idea of the sister being punished mm. for the other sister's crimes, but I don't think they're scary in a blood and guts jump scare way. Like, no. I think the sexual content has definitely uh, eclipsed the age re- restriction elements. The the gore, you could show to, you know, a 13-year-old and have no problem. Yeah. Yeah. I think the sexual content, you definitely wouldn't want it to be their first time watching it. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. this is <laughs> yeah. this is not what you want to to sh- illustrate an educational film for children it's <laughs> it's definitely a titillating piece um but um but yeah i think i think that uh it still does what it does but i don't mm. you know i don't think all horror films need to be scary i think sometimes um it is just about the the fable or the fantasy and i think that's what these are um, Absolutely, and sometimes showing you something that you you you're not expecting to see. I guess it's that idea of kind of transgressing a little bit in horror too, right? And mm. and I guess this movie, especially at the time, did that. Um, so yeah, I think that's all interesting. And there are a couple of moments that I thought were kind of effectively cool and creepy like i like the beginning when during the very opening scene where it kind of starts off on a different era and you see the floaty the shroud or whatever it is and you it know looks a bit whistle and i'll come to you kind of you know it's great i really like that 100 percent, very dementors very as yeah. you say whistle and i'll come to you and it, it's you know <laughs> it could quite easily just been like a spooky ghost in a sheet but actually yeah. it's really effective <laughs> it um, is isn't it yeah you know what that is. those visuals really stuck with me i i love those and there's there's a lot of like slow motion walking through um graveyards that's quite pensive and slow mm. and you could feel like a jump scare coming on but mm-hmm. they don't like there's nothing in this film that would keep me up at night like it's no. it's not scary in that sense it gives you a lovely full range of emotions as an audience member but it it, it wouldn't mess me up in the head <laughs> agreed <laughs> Hello, everybody. Just interrupting this week's episode momentarily to thank this week's sponsor. That's $20 Patreon subscriber Tony Ware. Uh, Tony, thank you so much for uh, becoming a $20 Patreon, for supporting the podcast and for sending me such a lovely message. I'm going to read that message to you guys right now. Uh, Tony says, Hi, Mike. Thanks so much for producing your awesome podcast. I absolutely love that you and your horde of brilliant guests are so enthusiastic and and engaging when discussing the episodes. And it feels like I'm being included in the chat as the discussions are easy to follow. I definitely have some favourite guests and love it when they reappear. My favourite season so far has been the folk horror season, especially the Hicksploitation spin-off. Your show was shared to me by one of my friends during the first lockdown and started off with listening to my favourite films in the Mind and Body season. I'm a massive David Cronenberg fan, so I started with Videodrome and the Cronenberg Deep Dives, as well as The Wicker Man and The Blood on satan's claw episodes i was hooked i then started from episode one and listened to everything else and i then joined patreon i run a horror account on instagram called at scared of horror with my best bud mickey every day we post up what we've been watching along with a very short dumbed down two-line review the account came about during the second lockdown in 2020 as we started doing a weekly remote watch together as we couldn't attend our usual horror festival which is celluloid screams in Sheffield and in 2021 we attempted to see more films than we did in 2020. The aim is just to connect with like-minded horror fans, share what we've been watching and enthuse about our favourite movies. We also quite like sharing Mary Wilde's memes. If anyone would like to give us a follow and get involved that would be brilliant. We love hearing from other horror fans and we are happy to share whatever horror related content we can. My interest in horror started when my parents would hire out video nasties on Betamax from the local video shop. Although I saw some terrible nasties that you really shouldn't be showing an 11 or 12 year old like Last House on the left. I also saw things like Scanners, Dawn of the Dead uh, and American Werewolf and that's where my obsession with horror really began. Once that head exploded in Scanners it was a done deal for me. I just wanted to finish by saying that along with the podcast I also got involved with the Evolution of Horror discussion group, the best group on Facebook. 
It's been a pleasure engaging with other horror fans as it's such a friendly group. I'd like to give a massive shout out to Tara and Vanessa for doing a great job of being admins and organising the monthly watch-alongs which I've thoroughly enjoyed being a part of. I hope to meet some more members of the group at the next EOH screenings or at this year's Fright Fest. Ah, oh, thank you so much, Tony, for that very kind, lovely message. Um, and I would recommend everybody following uh, at scared underscore of underscore horror um, on Instagram. I follow them and I love keeping up with their uh, posts and reviews. And Tony, I've had the pleasure of meeting a couple of times. I believe we met at Fright Fest last year in London, Tony, didn't we? And I think you also came to our dashcam screening at the Genesis a few weeks ago. So it was really cool to get to chat to you and uh, properly hang out. And hopefully we'll get to do that again soon. And I also echo uh, his big shout out to Tara and Vanessa. They are our brilliant uh, admins and moderators on the Evolution of Horror discussion group. They do such a good job there and they also run these monthly watch-alongs. Um, so yeah, if you want to get involved in those watch-alongs, you need to join the discussion group on Facebook. Each month, uh, Tara and Vanessa pick a different subgenre, they pick a different film and uh, everyone kind of watches along and chats together with it. It's really, really great. So uh, one more time, a huge plug for the Evolution of Horror discussion group and a huge thank you to this week's brilliant sponsor, Tony Ware. And if you want to get your own little dedicated segment just like this and become an Evolution of Horror sponsor like Tony, then you simply need to sign up to our Patreon at a $20 level. Patreon.com slash Evolution of Horror. still one of my favorite theme tunes that is of course the theme tune to stranger things because last week the final two episodes of season four of stranger things finally dropped um i'm sure most people have already watched and binged that season by now um but it's a little hint of what we've got coming up over on patreon in the next couple of weeks because we had multiple requests to cover stranger things season four in depth on Patreon um, and I can understand why I mean it has been one of the strongest seasons of Stranger Things so far and I think it might also be the most horror uh, that we've had in a single season of Stranger Things as well you know I think rightly so a lot of people have been comparing uh, this latest season to A Nightmare on Elm Street to Hellraiser and a bunch of other beloved 80s uh, horror properties so uh, yes in the next couple of weeks I will be bringing you you guys on patreon a deep dive discussion of the whole of stranger things season four uh, meanwhile for ten dollar patreon subscribers we are continuing our mini seasons uh, our legends of horror mini season uh, last week we dropped the latest installment of that in which louise blaine and i discussed the work and the career of james wan and lee Winnell, and we also had a deep dive discussion of insidious which was so much fun uh, in a couple of weeks time we'll be continuing our globe trotting horror mini series in which me and my guest Brad Hansen will be discussing Italian horror and bringing you a deep dive of Deep Red from 1975. So it's going to be a really fun uh, few weeks over on Patreon. So if you want to check out all of these bonus episodes and mini seasons and more, then sign up to our Patreon, patreon.com slash evolution of horror. Uh, $5 per month will get you monthly bonus episodes, but $10 per month will get you a brand new bonus episode every single week not only that everybody who signs up to our patreon no matter what tier will get a very special shout out on the podcast as a thank you speaking of i'm going to give everybody who signed up in the month of june a very special thanks so a big thank you to ivan buchter megan daniels scareal kylie greenleaf barry lloyd janet lavalley lollipops mal pescod danny's thomas uh, ali hayden shy 1000 kate marshall kimberly J Jones, Simon King, Stephanie, Hannah Simpson, Nikki H, ML, Cat Humphreys, Bash, Neil Ryan, Mark Lightfoot, Cable X, Ascani Clan, uh, Dave Follett, Johnny Parr, Adam, James Brains, Tom Garrett Bush, Jake, Steph Robinson, Miguel Mercado, Amy Salter, David Turngate, Kelly Shaw, and Keith McCarthy. A huge thank you to all of those people for signing up to our Patreon in the month of June. And if you want to join them and get treated to regular bonus content, 
content and more, then sign up now. Patreon.com slash Evolution of Horror. That's Patreon.com slash Evolution of Horror. Okay, let's return to the second half of this week's episode in which Jen Handorf and I discuss our second Hammer Horror lesbian vampire movie. This is Twins of Evil from 1971. Oh God, have mercy on this poor, unfortunate creature. In old Gothic Europe, they had two burning passions, witch hunting and devil worship. The black arts. They worship the devil. They're all slaves to Count Karnstein, and he is their evil master. Do you know what I want more than anything else? To meet Count Karnstein. I was really surprised by how much I liked this because of Me too. Uh, Mary and Madeline Collinson, who mm-hmm. were the the titular twins. Um mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, and it, it starts with them immediately, like beautiful, beautiful costuming, boobies right up to their necks in this, in this, really, so again, we're straight in with the boobs, straight we know in with what the this boobs. film is, um, <laughs> and they've got these incredible hats that are like an ostrich feather that covers their whole head. Um, and ostensibly they're sisters who have come from Venice because both of their parents have died. And I will say the film gives no time to that storyline or why one of the twins is clearly already evil. Like you could have, you could quite easily have a prequel in which she's the reason her parents are dead. And I would have believed it. Um, And, and my God, what, what super identical twins as well. Like I, like you really genuinely have to do a double take a couple times because in modern times, they would have just used the same actress for both. And it's so much better that they're actually sisters. It's so yes. good. Yes. Um, You're right. So, like, I've never seen such identical looking, identical twins. It's amazing. Yeah. And the styling and the costuming obviously, like, hit it home. But, like, mm-hmm. just so well done. And um, so they go to the countryside to live with their aunt, uh, who has been married to the Witchfinder General, it turns out. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, and he... he an evening he likes to go out and burn witches which is you know quite a an immediate start into the violence of the film as they drag a, a young woman from her bed and burn her yeah um uh you know the dude's fine but let's burn her and then yes. um yes. and then really quickly you find out there's you know the sexy count is back um mm-hmm. and i do love so there there are no vampires at the beginning of this film Sort of. They they kind of imply that they're maybe one has gotten out, but really what you see is that the count has got some weird demon kink, where he <laughs> likes to see people dress up in demonic robes and do a fake demonic sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Um, which. I love this. I picture Elon Musk doing this. <laughs> like, he's yeah. he's and because the best bit of it is the rich count gets like frustrated. He's like, "No, this is too hokey. This is not what I want. Leave yeah. me, leave yeah. me in this place, but leave her tied up, BT Dubs, because yeah. Defo, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> leave her tied up. Thank you. Leave her there. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and then you know, as is his wont, he he stabs this no clothes wearing women woman and her blood drips down from this sort of makeshift altar into the crypt mm-hmm. where it resurrects a vampire mm. um so this is actually i love that as a as a starting point i think it's, it's so great. bonkers and it's very of that era uh you know just the idea these elaborate blood dripping machines, very, very blade before its time. Yes. Um, you know, <laughs> like, it's true. Um, it's true. Uh, but uh, it's great. So, you know, ostensibly the vampires have all been killed and everything's fine, except this prick with his weird little blood ceremony uh, resurrects them. And then it's at this point that the evil twin hears about this guy and his, his sexy uh, evil castle it's basically the torture garden right mm-hmm. it's basically the torture garden in 1890 you know wherever yep. they are italy i guess yeah um and she's like i want to get me a piece of that torture garden <laughs> and so she sneaks off to the castle at night um except it's a whole vampire situation so she gets turned into a vampire and then they start to eat everyone 
And uh, her sister has been covering for her because obviously she's a twin. Mm. Um, but this bit is very whipping boy where the sister has been getting beaten for being her sister as well as for pretending she is her sister. I so know, it's awful. I feel poor really sister. bad for her. She's clearly yeah. like, I don't know what she did back in Venice to deserve this. I know, right? This is where we get into the classic, like anytime you have... A, a story about twins there has to be this element right where one of them pretends to be the other and uh this is where we get into like fucked up comedy of errors basically right where <laughs> this this the good twin is covering for the bad twin and the good twin does not have a good time of it really does she for the rest of the film no her yeah. her her witch burning obsessed uncle uh, <laughs> is super into whooping her ass and um, it's just not a pl- you know she's sitting there getting beaten up her sister's off in fuck castle um you know it's not fair uh and then eventually they figure out what's going on and her dirty so so her sister gets captured and tried and they're like we're gonna burn her she's a witch and uh but her the count and the sister do a body switcheroo and so they put the good sister in the jail cell and the bad sister back at the house but, you know, as convoluted narratives go, this only lasts for about three minutes, this little switch. But this was the bit that actually freaked me out the most, was, like, the fear on the actress's face as she was playing her sister who was being sentenced to death by her uncle. And they're, like, about to burn her. Like, that actually was quite scary. Upsetting. In the same way that, like, yeah. Blood on Satan's Claw and, like, that kind of stuff generates some real freaky tension. Well, totally. Like, that's the thing, right? It, this movie, I loved this one. Like, I I, th- I think I much preferred this to The Vampire Lovers, and I think partly because it's got that it's got that slightly more folk horror, witchfinder general mm. element to it, doesn't it? And um, that stuff will never not be upsetting and distressing, right? Because it actually happened, but because it's just a horrible yeah. thing, you know, th- this these, these, these Puritan you know dickheads just burning women for being women basically like and that that element to this film is pretty horrible any excuse right you know yeah (laughs) yeah yeah. Uh, it doesn't take much does it yeah well and it's interesting as well because when you consider from the production standpoint that when the first film was made in 1970 it was just the departure of the the era of of hammer and the guy who Mm -hmm. did all these sets and everything else Mm. but then when you get to twins of evil it's set in countryside Hickville small town mm. and the only thing that's spectacular is the twins costumes yes um yes. like the setting's still brilliant for what you know it's brilliant small town barns and whatever mm. but it's not the same lush luxurious villas of vampire lovers where we've been downgraded for sure um but the costumes are still just wow and again you start to think well if it's okay so if it's playboy models maybe they got designers in who wanted yeah. to dress these women and not being funny their bodies are clearly spectacular and if you have a spectacular body it's you know you can put it in nice looking clothes um so yeah the the sort of that transition of resources from yeah. the first film to this film i think is really present in the fact that we're seeing you know, a much dirtier version of this village. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and let's talk about those twins, first of all, Mary mm. and Madeline Collinson. Like you say, they were sort of Playboy models before mm. they were in this film um, and very much kind of, you know, plastered all over the poster as like these these are the sexy twins that are starring in this film right but but they're actually do you like really... do you like sexy girls what if there were like two sexy... of them exactly yeah <laughs> think of one sexy girl but twice right but and twice, that's what you get right? that's <laughs> what you get in this movie um uh yeah but they're actually really good i think in this film right they're pretty mm, they, no, they they're do amazing. a really good job yeah they absolutely smash it to the like just to the nth degree and in, in, in a way that was both beyond my expectations and it made me slightly sad that they don't really do anything after this. I mean, I, obviously mm. they had brilliant careers and were, were living their own lives the way they wanted to, but they, they don't do other films really after this. Mm. And mm-hmm. I, you know, it's definitely our loss. I think they could have been absolutely, you know, amazing as Scream Queens if they had yeah. continued that sort of career. And imagine yeah. imagine all the cool sort of in-camera effects you could do with twins and all that kind yes. of stuff, you know? Like, so oh. they, they were so good that it made me sad that there's not more of them in, in, in the history of, of these films. And actually, it's funny, isn't it? Because they are, of course, very much set up to be Maria is good as gold and Frida <laughs> is evil, right? But... 
Frida just wants to have some fun, basically, doesn't she? Really, and she, 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 she wants to be, you know, away from the, you know, the, uh, the, the constraints that her uncle is kind of putting upon her, basically. Um, and of course, that leads her to being killed and turned into a vampire. But she just wants to, she just wants to be free and have she some wants, fun. I think you know, Frida she just wants you know? to be herself, get her rocks <laughs> off, go up to a yeah. castle. You yeah, can't blame her. Her uncle's very boring. Um, you know, yeah, no, it is, it is very. And and that's quite a modern perspective as well. I think, uh, mm, you know, mm-hmm. the the young woman who wants to be liberated but is is a captor even before the film starts. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, but then also we sort of there's definitely an idea, a notion of her sort of being punished for that. So oh, it's God, not yeah. it's definitely yeah. not being portrayed as like everyone should be separately liberated. It's like no no no, you do that. You get you get your head cut off. That's how. That oh, totally. Ends. I mean, it, it kind of plays into the sort of. Um, slasher tropes almost doesn't it where you've got maria who is essentially like a final girl she's very pure she's very Mm. you know virginal good decent wholesome and ultimately prevails whereas her sister slightly more sexually liberated maybe slightly more you know quote unquote and and also willing to let her sister get a beating for like you know she's not she's not like without fault before she's murdering people (laughs) yeah that's very true she reminds me a bit and again i wonder this was the same year as Blood on Satan's Claw, so it probably isn't mm. inspired by that. But it, do you remember the character of Angel Blake in Blood on yes. Satan's Claw? Yeah, one hundred percent. Love it, love know, it, love yeah. it, love it, love it. Really, well, kind they, of gave and me and vibes of that. And you also get um, in in Blood on Satan's Claw, you get her sort of sidekick, the girl with the sort of mousy brown hair and the, the yeah. friend who's the sidekick turned first victim. And it's definitely a very similar relationship that where initially they're. Uh, they're complicit in the crimes of the the lead evil girl uh, mm-hmm. and then eventually themselves become her victim which which is you know a bit there's there's a lot of uh uh the crucible um yeah. in a lot of this i think uh, the play um and it's interesting too because when you look at the stories of witchcraft and the historical aspects of it weirdly the crucible like retconned a lot of stuff and everyone was like oh no he read the real papers so we're just going to base it on his stuff Mm -hmm. um and again it's that chardonnay effect a little bit but um but uh uh it is it is still you know categorically horrific so i guess if they get a a couple things wrong it's fine but yeah those two films in particular this idea you know it's very much that same relationship as in the crucible as in um with abigail and her little sidekick in the in the thing where initially you know they're they're charging at people together but then suddenly they both become the victims um yeah and I think arguably you've got three potential villains in this film, right? All quite different and really interesting because you've got mm. Frida, the the twin, the evil twin, the vampire twin. <laughs> you've got Count Karnstein, Karnstein, who is the real baddie, I suppose, of the whole thing—the Satan worshiping, you know, vampire well, summoning, you know, he's the trilogy son. baddie as well. Like, they're yeah. re- his family is represented in the baddie in, in each of the trilogies. Exactly, yeah. Who really kind of causes all this stuff to happen? But then also Peter Cushing's Gustav, right? This terrifying and i think by today's standard probably the most diabolical character yeah. maybe who we just see straight up burn like a whole bunch of innocent women in the first half of the film before the vampire stuff even kicks off right as well so well and yeah. it, and it is it's it's that classic thing too of this era where you know let's be honest if he was burning all those women it was definitely get his rocks off but in the film oh, he's yeah. painted as just like very holy like yeah. very like pious and and like no no I have to tear the the uh, naked women from their beds and throw them naked on a fire, mm. not because it gets me off, but because God <laughs> wants me to. Um, <laughs> yeah. And it so so it is you know and I'm I'm saying that in earnestness it is portrayed as because he's this pious man, but yeah. that's that is portrayed as wicked just as wicked as anything else because the the fact that he's willing to let his niece be burned. Yeah, um, I was is... I was worried for a moment that they were going to turn him into the hero at the end and give him I'm a glad, redemption yeah. when he goes up to fight, you know, the Count. Um, but mm-hmm. then actually he gets killed and thrown off the balcony pretty quickly. So I'm like, fine, okay, yeah, don't give him redemption because he's still, let's not forget, he was still pretty evil for most of His this film. His will come! Yeah, <laughs> yeah <absolutely>. exactly. <laughs> um, and I think there's even a moment, isn't there, where they sort of call it out. Like there's a moment when the other... The sort of male hero figure—I can't remember mm. what his name is now—but but, but um, he he sort of says to all of those 
Puritan witch hunters. He's like, oh, I notice you all jump at the chance to go burn them if they're a woman, you know, but this guy who's got loads of money and is the emperor's son and doing all kinds of diabolical things, I've noticed you haven't gone to, you know, go and sort him out yet, sort of thing. Yeah, it's got know? quite yeah. an egalitarian sort of unionist byline at the end. It's yeah. sort of very, like, rise up. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, the angry lynch mob rising but up. But it is a yeah. bit Frankenstein at that point, you know? Like, there's, there's, in, in, and this kind of goes back to what I was saying where these films are sort of patchworks of what had worked before you know and and the again looking at the third one and looking at the first one you can see how much of it was um them knowing what they were doing and co- versus copying what had worked before uh in vampire lovers versus twins of evil but again honestly if if the collinson sisters hadn't been as good as they were i don't think anybody would talk about twins of evil i think if it had been any any less talented, I think it would have been lost again to the to the tales of time, as it were. Yeah, that's time. really interesting. I think Peter Cushing is good as a villain too. Like I like him when he's bit, when he's a bit meaner. You know, I thought he was. I think good he always freaks me out, so I always see him as a bit as a bit like yeah. evil. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, but yeah, yeah no, I mean, true. like he he you know he's very clearly he can phone it in and still smash it. Yeah. But but so he's very clearly amazing in this. Mm-hmm. Um but again, you know, mm-hmm. it's that thing I was saying earlier of I I think there's films he's better in, there's films he's a more interesting character in. Yeah. So I don't think he would have been enough on his own to you know, to sustain this film well what plus is it, 50 again years later. Again, like we've seen the ultimate version of this role in Matthew Hopkins, played by Vincent Price, right? And exactly. it does feel a little bit sub Matthew Hopkins, essentially. It's it, it's I think. It, it's very rough. I mean, was was Witchfinder General first? Was 68, it 1968. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, it's it's like ripped from the pages, then, isn't it? Like it's yeah. very clearly. But and and again, it goes back to let's do let's do it like they did it. Let's do it like that one, um, because they're not necessarily making choices that they're innovating because of their taste. They're trying to copy what the brand was doing before without the initial voices there. I think it leads into that idea of Hammer being kind of, at this point, exploitation filmmakers, right? Where they Mm. are basically jumping on what is popular right now, what are the trends... And what mm-hmm. can we make a film about that would kind of cash in on that? And you see that throughout the 70s with with Hammer. And it does feel a bit like, yeah, okay, sexy vampires, you know, a little bit of a little bit of uh, some boobs, some gore. We've got a bit of, oh, these kind of like occult, the satanic panic. Like this is this is quite a big thing in the late 60s, early 70s. We mm. chuck a bit of that in there, mix that with our vampire mythology. <laughs> you know, it feels like it's all sort of in there. Well, yeah, and it's, you know, again, you go back to the roots of the company. It, it started off as a company that was making entertaining financially viable films based on experience and taste yes and then by at this point it's it transitions into a company doing the same thing but reacting to cultural trends rather than doing it based on taste it's reactionary rather than internal absolutely yeah that was another thing we talked about because you know um 1958 when they made Frankenstein and Ham- and Dracula mm. that was kind of reigniting gothic horror they were kind of ahead mm-hmm. of the curve there and then slowly they ended up slightly behind the curve you know by the 1970s it's like everything else in the world had overtaken them and by mm-hmm. that point they are kind of trying to keep up with what else is going on you, you know? know it's what we see a lot in distribution companies and film production companies when they sort of start to eat themselves uh when they when they get popular and turn you know they sell to a bigger conglomerate and then mm-hmm. all the original people leave and then it just starts to do a version of what it used to do <laughs> like yeah like yeah. focus features or something like that you know like all these places that this happens um, yeah it's really fascinating and it's the cycles like you said at the beginning it's always cycles it's like even at the in the universal era you start with all the popular monsters mm. in the early 30s by the time you get to the mid 1940s you've got abbott and costello with these mm. monsters and they become kind of self parodies by the time you get to the end of a cycle and then they disappeared the monsters and then they are resurrected for hammer in the late 50s and now they're starting to get to that point again where they're sort of becoming increasingly camp increasingly kind of silly and self parody as well yeah well and it's you know we're seeing that again really uh you know and it's it is it's (laughs) <laughs> you know it's it's so naive culturally to think that we evolve upwards and not in cycles like obviously we you know we're we're animals that have been responding to things for for thousands of years and yeah of course we do it in cycles um but uh it's really interesting now as we're getting sort of 120 years into recorded cinema 
we can look at those cycles. Oh, well, I mean, you know, the the title of your podcast, Evolution of Horror. I'm sure you've begun to notice in your research that it's it's not a straight line, right? Absolutely. It's not like the graphic, or it's not that. It's it's you know ups and downs and parabo- uh, parabolic curves and all sorts. Always, yeah. Um, and other thing we should mention. Barely any lesbianism in this one, right? Where's the lesbianism really disappointing. in this one? <laughs> really disappointing. And yeah. and I think, you know, I'm I'm as grateful as I am disappointed by that because the lead characters are real sisters. So yeah. Well know, that's true. That's there's... true. I did think at one point I thought, where's this gonna go? Yeah, there's 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 <laughs> Incest is a, a bridge too far, um, but uh, but uh, yeah, you know it's it's again, and I think it's it's that sort of supposed just watching a woman be sexual is enough to call her a lesbian, like being in part. And it's it's funny too because if you look at films um, like sort of supposed documentaries about lesbians at this time, like Sweden, Heaven or Hell. I don't know if you've ever watched that. There's a section in it on sexual liberation in Sweden and, and lesbians. And they're they are portrayed as like extremely sexed up, like <laughs> like just after it, pawing at each other all the time. So I don't know, like I don't know contextually if that is how lesbians felt they were culturally portrayed at the time, but it's certainly the impression I'm getting from these films is that just like it, yeah, you know. and it and it's funny the way you talk talked about sort of bisexual erasure as well because that's mm. so true, isn't it? I mean, I I recently d- edited a, a video essay for the BBC. It was written and, and voiced by Catherine Bray, and um, she basically talked all about how the bisexuality almost just didn't exist until recently mm. in, in 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 film and television. It's like you were either gay or straight and people couldn't really, you know, get their head Fathom around anything else. Yeah, exactly. It's so Everybody's funny. super scared that they're a bit gay and they don't want to talk about it. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we all don't want to admit that we're it, it, it's all a spectrum, right? And that we're you were once on in the spectrum. gymnasium locker room and felt a tingle. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and just exactly. can't can't face discussing that because culture has so villainized uh yeah. yeah anyway yeah like you know i'm bi i'm married to a man i'm definitely aware of bi erasure i've read it in a book i've seen it yeah. in pictures i've experienced <laughs> it in life um yeah. Yeah. and it is it is interesting because even for myself like it, it wasn't something i started to think about until after the films were over and i was thinking they're not really lesbians are they and i was like oh shit no they're bi and it's it's you know it's it's a sort of catch all when it was a more binary when sexuality was repre- uh, was represented in that more binary way either other straight or queer that uh you know queer was queer if you're queer you're queer and and you know there wasn't really a perspective for that because i suppose the binary made it uh less acceptable as well and again talking about those outsiders talking about people who don't quite fit into the cultural norms as dictated by society you know, that's what you're looking at there. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. But- and I think obviously these 99% of these movies are made by men, you know, distributed mm. oh, by yeah. men. And 100%. of course, there is this thing that I almost still exists now where most of the queer vampire stories are, if they're, if they're about women, they're a little bit more erotic and sexual. Whereas actually when they're about men, they are less so. Like, you know, people still talk about Interview with the Vampire as being one of the most homoerotic you know, <laughs> um, male vampire stories. But there is an actual Actually, anything explicit in that? That's sort of coded. Did they kiss right? once, or have I made that up? In I don't my brain? think they do. I don't think they do. They bite each other, obviously. Uh, Ooh, but that's it. Yeah, that's but that's it. just implied sexuality. They do. Yeah. They do a lot of like four ways, which is weird. But yeah, like, yeah, they do. They, they do, do a lot, a lot of ways. Eiffel towering in the middle of like Victorian England. But right. Like... But in terms of like out and out gay men vampire stories, I don't think maybe until True Blood was it like explicit on screen. You know, so that's really. I, interesting oh man, as well. you know, I feel like as, uh, someone with knowledge better than I, I, I would be sad to hear that as true. But um, yeah. But you I mean, know, I'm does, sure there must have been that more... There's a gap in the market then, isn't yeah. there? Because yeah. how. I mean, how gay are vampires, right? Like, right? you know, right. Like- exactly, exactly. And I'm sure there were there were other smaller, more niche indie kind of examples. But I think in terms of mainstream culture, it's just like from what I found, it's not there. Whereas with with lesbians, that really kicked off at this point, early seventies. You know? Isn't that true in horror? Like generally, though, we don't see a lot of queer men in horror. You know, there's like, uh, is it Harris Smith? Harrison Smith, who's who's a queer genre filmmaker, but um. But we don't see a lot of queer male horror films. I think we see a lot more queer female horror films or just like queer umbrella queer. Yeah. Maybe it's because yeah. the industry was was 
more dictated by straight white men than we thought or hoped it would have been. Or maybe that's because culture was, was, you know, straight washing things or whatever. But it's, I would say there's definitely, you know, there's a, there's a vacuum to be filled there, so to speak, for, for gay cinema, gay horror. Um, yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? It's really interesting. But yeah, fascinating to look at these two movies, especially given about their reputation. And and you know, of course, I suppose to us now they don't they seem a little bit maybe more vanilla than we were expecting. But at the mm. time, they were considered a big deal. These movies, weren't they? And especially in Britain, especially in uptight Britain, you know, like that's the thing. Well, and I think it's it's nice to think about them in that context as well because they're yeah. they're like they're not so in your face now that you can't watch it before noon you know exactly exactly i know it's just to say it's a fun context to imagine them in but like you know it's definitely fine (laughs) yeah yeah there was somebody on that documentary wasn't there that was saying like this at the time gave you know all of those men in raincoats in soho something legit to go and see that was mainstream (laughs) you know and it was like (laughs) finally the perverts have a place to go (laughs) exactly thank god thank god (laughs) get them if they're called you're called get them inside (laughs) put a coat on them (laughs) Uh, so there you go I mean like I think that's kind I mean I I don't think there's much more to talk about with these movies really because like again they're sort of fairly thin when it comes to plot and everything else aren't they really you know um, they sort of are what they are they're product of their time they did what they were supposed to do for audiences at the time I think you know exactly I think I think as films they are visually titillating and interesting but it's really their context that makes them something worth seeking out and engaging with with. like it's it's are there other films exactly like this yes but not exactly like this because these were made at a very special time by a very special mix of people so mm, mm-hmm. so there you go um well jen thank you so much my final question um for you of course is what's your favorite vampire film so so I initially thought this was going to be really hard until I remembered OG Buffy the Vampire Slayer existed and oh. that's 100% 100%. Um, Do you mean as in like the, the film the 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 Buffy film? Yeah, Amazing. Yeah, 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 the film, the film um with OG Pee Wee Herman as a vampire doing a joke that lives rent free in my head where uh he does this like physical comedy gag out of nowhere that the film is just so totally bonkers where you think he's dead on the ground, but he's actually just kind of listening to the conversation of the foreground. And somebody looks over at him again, and he starts, oh, no, this steak in my body, it hurts so much. Oh, no, I'm dying. (laughs) Um, And it is, like, it's so funny that that film is what so many things wish they were, and it did it so effortlessly. And it gets really overshadowed by the series, so a lot of people don't, don't think about it. And, you know, because it's not the series, a lot of people... Are disappointed by it because it's not doing the same thing but i'm old enough that i watched it before the series existed and i was not therefore tainted by that oh, i love <laughs> but yeah, it there you go go out and watch it check out Wee herman on a horror film <laughs> amazing perfect oh what an excellent choice uh, well jen thank you so much and before we finish just tell us is there anything that you've got coming up that you want to plug or where should people kind of come and find you if they want to come chat to you on the socials etc i'm i'm always excited to chat to people mm-hmm. uh at jay handorf uh, at jay rather on twitter um so you know we've got a bit of excitement because uh it's the 10 year anniversary for borderlands next year um Mm. and so we're putting together some interesting tidbits for people and if they haven't ever seen it in a theater before there's going to be some opportunities for that so Mm. we'll just keep people uh keep people aware follow the socials for more amazing jen thank you very much excellent And that's it for this week. Thank you so much for listening and a huge thank you to this week's brilliant guest, Jen Handorf. So let us know what you thought of this week's episode and what you thought of these two films, The Vampire Lovers and Twins of Evil. Uh, you can email us evolutionofhorror at gmail.com. You can also find us on all the socials, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and Letterboxd. And if you want to discuss this week's episode with fellow listeners, there are two places you can go. You can join the Evolution of Horror Discord or the Evolution of horror discussion group which you can find on facebook you can find this podcast in all the regular podcast places and if you get a sec i'd be so grateful if you could spare a moment to drop us a little rating or review on apple podcasts which really helps us get discovered by new listeners 
So, on to next week then, and we are continuing with our lesbian vampire movies, and we're heading over to Europe, because next week I'm going to be joined by the one and only Stacey Ponder, and we are going to be discussing Daughters of Darkness from 1971, and The Blood Spattered Bride from 1972. These two movies are incredible. I cannot wait to discuss them with Stacey. So, join us next week for all of this and more on the evolution of horror.